Section 3 is client investment recommendations and strategies. A three-year treasury bond has a coupon of 9% and is currently paying out 5%, while the federal funds rate is at 3.5% and the consumer price index is 3%. What's the rate of inflation? Oh my gosh, there was so much information in that question. But what do we look at to determine inflation? The CPI. So the CPI tells us inflation, so 3%. There's so much information often in a question just there to trick you. Time-weighted rate of return is a measure of the compound rate of growth in a portfolio. It is often used to compare the returns of investment managers since it eliminates the distorting effects created by the inflows of new money. It is also called the geometric mean return. Let's say your client wants to pass along all of his money to his son upon his death, but he also wants to be able to use his assets while he's alive, but doesn't want his son to have access to his financial assets. How should he title his assets? He doesn't want the money after he dies to go through the probate process. What would you do? You do what's called a POD, a payable on death or transfer on death designation. It's like naming a beneficiary for your financial assets. When you have a POD or TOD designation, probate is avoided. The beneficiary upon producing the death certificate now will be able to transfer the assets into the beneficiary's name. But while that dad is alive, the son has no access to the dad's assets. Let's say your client dies and the wife inherits the IRA. What should she do with it? Generally speaking, she should treat the inherited IRA as her own. We have a question about the after-tax yield of a 7% muni bond. So we have a muni bond with a nominal yield of 7% issued in Florida, an Arizona client that's in the 30% federal tax bracket, 30% federal tax bracket, so the bond's from Florida, your client lives in Arizona, their Arizona tax rate is, uh, let's see, 6%. So let's, let's dissect this for a minute. When we get a municipal bond and it's from another state, the rule says, they tax themselves but not each other. So you can disregard the federal tax bracket because this interest is not taxable federally. So the after-tax return on this municipal bond take its nominal yield times 100% minus the tax bracket. So 7% times the 94% that you get to keep, the after-tax yield, that was a question, after-tax yield, because this was the nominal yield on this bond. The after-tax yield is 0 0.0658, so 6.58 percent. So once again, information in there that you did not need there to trick you. What if the bond was issued in Arizona? Then you would have disregarded all of the tax brackets and the after-tax yield would, would have been 7 percent because it wouldn't have been taxed at the state or federal level. If you're making an investment recommendation to a client that's in her 70s, her time horizon would be of more concern than her values and attitudes. So the time horizon is the length of time the money will remain invested. If you're named executor of an estate, the first thing you should always do is establish the estate's checking account. A 529 plan can be set up for anyone. I could set myself one up today. I'm much older than 18, where educational savings accounts can only be set up for someone that is under age 18. If you have a tenants in common account, the assets can be owned unequally. So there's two types of joint accounts, a joint tenant with rights of survivorship, which the asset must be owned equally, and a tenants in common, where the assets can be owned unequally. In tenants in common, if one of the parties dies, their interest passes on to their estate. Where when you have joint tenants with right of survivorship, the interest of the deceased party passes along to the survivor. So usually husband and wife do joint tenants with right of survivorship. But if you're buying, let's say, a vacation home with a friend, you'd want to do tenants in common. 
The test sometimes has questions that go something like this. Your client lived in Arizona, passed away, didn't have a will, owned a house in the woods of Montana. Who's going to get the house in Montana? So what's going to happen is that house in Montana is going to go through the probate process in Montana. So the, the laws of intestacy of the state in which the property is located determines who gets that asset. So it's really interesting that even though the client lives in Arizona, it's whatever state that house was in that determines who gets that house. The laws of intestacy in the state where the property is located. The test loves the K-1. So the K-1 is a form that is used to report income in various situations. Members in LLCs get K-1s, partners in partnerships, and shareholders of an S corporation. They all receive K-1s. So their profit or their loss flows through to them on a K-1. A limit order will execute, or I should say may, because it might not ever execute, but a limit order executes at an exact price or better. So it never becomes a market order. So we talked about in the general part of the course, stops and limits. If the stop price is hit, it becomes a market order to buy or sell. But limit orders will only be executed at that price or better. So if you're buying, better's lower. If you're selling, better's higher. You cannot own jewelry in an IRA. No way, you cannot own jewelry in an IRA. Jewelry would fall under a collectible, like rare coins or antiques. An IRA cannot own collectibles. An IRA can also not have life insurance in it. You cannot purchase life insurance in an IRA. If you want to buy a bond, you can buy it either in a cash or in a margin account. If you want to buy a bond on margin, however, that can only be done in a margin account. To short a stock must be done in a margin account. So most of these ones you know. Tax return time, 1040. Everybody gets two generic tax deductions. There's a personal exemption and a standard deduction. So when you file your tax return, you, your husband, you, your wife, your kids, you get a personal exemption for yourself and however many dependents that you have. Now, what's the amount of the exemption is never on the test. It is going to change from year to year to year. Everybody's worth the same amount of money, generally speaking. Certainly within current tax code, there's what's called um, the piece provision that might change depends upon how much your client actually earned. But generally speaking, every personal exemption amount is the same. It's not less for a four-year-old and more for your 15-year-old. It's the same for everybody. Now, when people are doing their taxes, they can either itemize on their tax return or they can take the standard deduction. Generally speaking, when someone owns a house, their mortgage interest currently is uh, tax write-off. It will, generally speaking, allow them to have a larger um, deductible amount than taking the standard deduction. If you are a member in an LLC or a shareholder of an S corporation, you have limited liability. The most you can lose is whatever you have invested. It is a flow-through entity, both LLCs and S corporations. Flow-through of profits and losses or losses to the owners or members. We know LLCs have members. Strategic asset allocation is a passive asset allocation model where you have a certain percentage in stocks, a certain percentage in bonds, and over time you need to do what? Do you remember? You need to rebalance, rebalance. Tactical asset allocation is, just like it sounds, it's active. Tactical asset allocation has higher transaction costs than strategic asset allocation. You are trying to time the market when you engage in tactical asset allocation. Buy and hold. What do you think this would be, active or, s or passive? Buy and hold, of course, is passive. Buy and hold. You can use buy and hold to manage a bond portfolio or a stock portfolio. A barbell strategy, that was the active portfolio management strategy for bonds. So you have barbell, right? Some that mature in the short run, some in the long run, and as the long ones get to the middle, you have to sell those and buy new long-term bonds, so barbell. Anytime you receive a gift, your cost basis is equal to that of the giver. 
You assume the original cost basis and holding period when you receive a gift, no matter if it is a gift of a house or a stock. A small cap company is a company that has a market capitalization of 300 million to 2 billion. Dollar cost averaging is a defensive investment strategy where you invest the same amount of money at regular intervals. You will have an average cost per share that is less than your average price. It does not protect you against market risk. You may still lose money. In a limited partnership, you get a K1 that shows you your percentage of profits or losses. The partners in a limited partnership get a proportionate distribution of the partnership's gains and or losses to pay taxes on. Partnerships are flow through tax entities. A non-qualified plan, such as a deferred compensation plan, can be accessed by general creditors if a company should go broke, whereas their qualified plan cannot. On a decedent's will, a per capita distribution will distribute the assets equally amongst all listed persons. On a decedent's will, a per stirps distribution will be representational, which is not always equal. So let me show you a story here. So there was this uh, older lady that I knew, her name was Jessie. And Jessie had two kids, her a grown adult children uh, were named Carl and John. And let's say that Jesse had assets totaling six million dollars, okay? And Carl had two kids and John had four. Now, if Jesse wants this six million dollars distributed to her grandchildren, equally, okay, she would want to set up her will with a per capita distribution, per capita, at the grandchild level. If that were the case, I mean, don't grandparents love their grandchildren equally? I certainly hope so. Each child would get, upon Jesse's death, a million dollars. But can you see something there that if you were John or Carl, ooh, particularly Carl, you might not like that. It's basically with this per capita distribution, giving less to Carl's kids than what Carl might think is his fair share. So what happens if instead of a per capita distribution, we switch it to be per stirps? So per stirps is Latin for down the pipe. So basically what it means is that, I mean, Jesse had two kids, right? Carl and John. And why shouldn't Carl's kids get down the pipe their fair share? Ah, oh, look at that. Carl's kids get more. And then John chose to have four kids, so his four kids, representational, each basically get an eighth of Jesse's assets. So you could see how this designation, making sure that your client understands, per capita means if it goes to the grandchildren, the will says that it goes to the grandchildren per capita, they each got it equally. But if it said it went to the grandchildren per stirps, then they got their representational through their parents, right, distributions, which ended up with Carl's kids getting much more than John's four children would get individually. So designations that you will want to feel comfortable with for your test. A limited partnership has a limited lifespan. The test loves corporations are unlimited. LLCs can be unlimited but all the other business entities have limited lifespans. An LLC has members, not shareholders. Thus, an LLC cannot have unlimited shareholders. It doesn't have shareholders, it has members. It can have as little as one member or as many members as it wants, but LLCs do not have shareholders. Sector rotation is an investment strategy that involves active management combined with a long-term investment approach. 
This technique is based upon either economic market cycles or calendar cycles. It assumes that some sectors will be up at certain times of the cycles and down at others. To use this approach, the boom and bust cycles must be determined in the sector that it's being invested in. So if the sector is in a bust period, buy. When the sector recovers and begins to peak in the boom cycle, sell the stock. Sector rotating requires looking ahead to the next cycle while being fully invested in the current one. It's important to remember that when a person dies, their home is valued for estate tax purposes as of the fair market value as of the date of death. So as of the date of death, the house is worth 500000 The kids who inherited the house sell it six months later for 700000 How much is included in the estate? The value as of date of death, 500000 When a stock trades in the over-the-counter market, it is purchased at the ask price. If the broker-dealer is acting as a broker, the client will buy at the ask price plus a commission. If the broker-dealer is acting as a dealer, the client will buy at the ask price plus a mark up. That includes our discussion of new topics for Section 3.